evening. So good evening, everybody. Thank you for that greeting. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you all of you for being here tonight. Um, this is the seminar series with the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife, hosted by the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife. But this is the College of Natural Resources seminar series titled Landmark Environmental Policies, History, Impacts, and the Future. Um, tonight, we have Bree Richardson, who's going to be talking about um, how these landmark policies impact uh, real on the ground natural resources practices. And before I get into introducing Bree and, and uh, moving on, I wanted to cover a few details. I should turn this thing on. Just a few announcements and acknowledgements. First, I'd like to say thank you to everybody who brought this seminar series together. Like I said, while this is hosted by the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife, um, this is a, a collaborative effort with the College of Natural Resources. So I'd like to thank everybody in the College of Natural Resources that helped um, promote this and helped bring it all together. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Shelley Dubé, who is the interim director of the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife, who has helped me um, make or pull all the logistics together, uh, contact speakers, and so on. And I'd also like to thank our, thank our previous director, Scott Hingstrom, who helped identify sp uh, speakers as well. Um, and of course, uh, the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife is a UW Extension. Uh, the director position is partially funded by UW Extension, so we work closely with them, and so I'd like to thank them as well. So um, this is the second to last pr uh, presentation in this series. Um, finally, next week, we will have Keith Norris, who is uh, a, a director of communications, of policy communications with the, with the Wildlife Society. And he is going to be talking, again, about how the, these landmark environmental policies affect on the ground uh, practices for a nonprofit organization um, and for the conservation, the conservation professionals within those organizations. Um, so, that is going to be a virtual presentation. He's going to be, going to be joining us virtually, um, but he will. Uh, but we will be having a watch party in this room, so you'll be able to ask questions and participate both in person and um, online if you like. So, but please come. I would appreciate seeing you all. And finally, um, we have a we have an. Um, uh, an agreement with the with the local tribes of this area for to um, go through an, a land acknowledgement every time that we have a public facing event, which this one is. So the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point exists upon land inhabited by the original indigenous people of this area, including the Ho Chunk, Menominee, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and the many other nations and groups that predate colonial borders. We acknowledge that with the colonization, Native Native American people have been dispossessed of their lands and irreparably changed the actions of the individuals and institutions. We acknowledge our responsibility to understand and respond to those actions. In partnership with the Native American Center, we commit to working together to honor the past, be intentional in the present, and to build our future with truth. And so with that, thank you. And I would like to invite Dr. Rob McKitch to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Jennifer. So I have the pleasure of introducing Bree as our speaker today. So as you look at this Kind of first slide. Get this slide advancer. She has it. Oh, I'm so sorry. I need that. You need that. Yes, huh? I need that. Um, sorry. Oh, we're all good. So as you can read her, her introduction and bio, she is an environmental analysis and review specialist with the DOT sort of thing. Um, I've known Bree for 12, 13 years now, and first as a student and now over time as a colleague working through research, working through other projects, that sort of thing, and we've been become kind of close friends over time in this way. So you're going to see her presentation about building bridges, but what you're not going to see is about some of the other things that Bree does. I'm not going to go into everything, obviously, but putting a little bit of a personal spin on it sort of thing. I, I like her little blurb here about um, protecting the environment for all creatures in this way. So everybody likes a picture of kittens and puppies, <laughs> right? Why not? So that's a big part of, of her life that she's dragged me into. So she's responsible for me having this little lady that I go home to every <laughs> night, which is absolutely wonderful. Um, and then over the course of time, I've enjoyed my experiences watching her bring this little angel into the world sort of thing, and I can prove it that she has involved me in, in part of that as well at the same time. So with that, I won't say any more. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, my talk is going to be on um, how we build bridges and how policy kind of plays in a, plays a role um, in the design of that. 
Um, so to first start off, I am with the Department of Transportation, not typically an agency you guys see at the, um, the Career Center. Um, we do have a small environmental group within the department um, so that we make sure that our environmental policies um, are applied and followed through. Um, to just give a little bit of background on the Department of Transportation. Um, so we are set up as five regions. I'm located in North Central Region um, out of Wisconsin Rapids. Um, so we oversee the transportation system for the state um, that covers 12,000 miles of road and 14,000 bridges. Um, so we want to make sure that the transportation system stays safe for us to travel on. Um, to kind of show you guys in Portage County a few of the, the, the state systems we have. Um, we oversee the, the interstate. Um, and there's a couple of like Highway 10, Highway 54. A lot of what you guys might be familiar with for uh, transportation projects comes from construction. Um, that, that's when we're on the ground kind of building, rehabbing um, our, our roads, our bridges. But there's a lot that goes into the design. So we might be designing something for two to four years. So the, the map with all of the colorful lines, that's showing our six-year program. So we have about 1,200 projects that are scheduled for construction over the next six years across the entire state. And in addition to the state system, we also facilitate um, the, our local program. So there's funding through federal highways um, that gives the, the locals an opportunity to replace bridges um, as well as reconstruct some roads. So you can see on this map, it's the same in Portage County. The purple shows all of the, the local road systems. And you can see there's, there's dramatically more roads within this system. So as part of WISDOT, we any funding that the, the locals get through um, this process, we do oversee that design and construction. And this is, this is the important part for, for policy. So we're getting federal funding. It's coming from federal highways. It's being delivered to WISDOT. Nearly all of our projects have, federally fund, f have federal funds on them. Um, most of our projects is funded by about 80% with those federal funds. And when we get those federal funds, we also have to make sure we're following NEPA. So that's the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, and just a little quick <coughs> excuse me, background. Um, NEPA is it's the framework to making sure that all of our projects that are using federal funds, that we're evaluating the potential for environmental impacts, we're looking at ways to avoid it, um, and ensuring that what we're, we're proposing to do has been vetted, we've minimized our environmental impacts, and we can deliver our project to have that safe transportation system, as well as minimizing our impact to the natural resources. To take just a bit of a step back um, about NEPA, I know a lot of the, the talks have kind of gone into like the history um, with the different environmental policies. Um, but if you're not aware, the, in the 70s, the 60s and 70s, there was a, there was a really large push in environmental protection. Um, the Clean Water Act came out of the Cuyahoga River in Ohio was burning. Um, there was no fish that lived in that river for, for many years. You couldn't swim in it. You couldn't drink the water. Um, the Clean Air Act came out of um, industry. There is an incident where smog settled into a town um, and caused a lot of respiratory distress as well as a few deaths. Um, so back in the 60s and 70s, um, it was a completely different time, and there, there was a lot of push um, to do better for the environment and, and clean it up for, for ourselves. The interesting thing with NEPA is it's not, it's not a very specific policy like water or air. It's considered an umbrella policy. 
So it encompasses all of these environmental policies, um, executive orders, any rules and regulations. And NEPA was actually created a little bit earlier, um, right after air quality and clean water. And it was a senator from Washington. Uh, he had the, the thought of how are we going to um, hold ourselves to making sure that we apply these policies. We can enact all these that we want, but going forward for future generations, as well as the future policies that were enacted, how are we gonna make sure that they're, they're applied and implemented? So you can see in both of these images, we have a whole variety of policies that, that are kind of fall under NEPA and make sure that we're evaluating. And this is where it comes back to DOT. So we're getting those federal funds. So we want to make sure that all of those environmental policies, um, that we're minimizing our environmental impacts, that when we're using these federal funds, um, we're doing our due diligence for, for everyone that's the taxpayer, um, while also being able to deliver our project and make sure that we have that safe transportation system. So the, the one thing with NEPA is it sets up a framework. It, one of the requirements is we have to justify or tell why we're using these monies, why we're going to have the impacts. And that's what we call our purpose and need. What is the purpose of the project? Why do we need to do this? So the purpose, um, I'm going to use um, bridges for this talk. Um, but most of our, our projects, it's to maintain that, that safe transportation system. We want to be able to get from point A to point B um, and not have any issues. And then the need, why do we need to do that? A lot of our bridges are aging. Um, we have bridges tend to last 75 years. Um, so we are replacing a lot of bridges that were, were built um, in the early 1900s. So these two pictures um, show actually two closed bridges. So we need to replace the bridge because they're, they're so deteriorated that we can't even travel across them safely. But even bridges that still are open and operating, um, they're the, the structure might still be sound, but, but they're deteriorating. There's some holes popping up. Um, so there, there's definitely a need. We, we don't want all of our, our bridges closed. Um, or this one, it goes over a railroad. The bridge is actually just missing half of it. <laughs> Um, so, so we do, I mean, the, the, the life that we live, we do need to have our transportation system and we need it to be safe, but we also need to be mindful of any environmental impacts in the surrounding landscape. So when we go to replace a bridge though, the, some of them we could just pick up and move out of the way and maybe drop a new one down. Um, that's not typical. So you can, you can see in this, this video, um, it's a bridge replacement that happened last year. This bridge was um, built in the early 1900s. Um, they tried lifting it. Um, they did it successfully without dropping any pieces into the water. Um, there were concerns when it got to construction if that would um, go smoothly. And you can see how slow they're, they're moving. So this bridge was closed in the 90s. So it's on um, a small road over in Wood County. People had actually started driving through the river because the bridge was closed. So you can see that they were able to successfully pick the whole thing up and they end up dropping it off to the side. And it is very slow. So nothing terribly dramatic. Um, 
So, and that's something to, we need to consider is like where, where are these bridges on the landscape? What, what are different environmental factors? Um, so you can see in both of these two photos, um, two large roadway systems. Um, some of the bridges are going over other roads. Um, some of the bridges are going over waterways. These are all things that um, we need to consider that I'll get into a little bit more detail. But the other thing to consider is those different structures. So that video that you saw, they were able to pick it up um, and move it, but not all structures are built the same way. And you can see, um, again, in all of these photos as well, that there's a lot of differences on the landscape. We have some that cross streams, um, some cross roads. We have some really large structures, some small structures. And how those structures are built can dictate how that structure is also demolished. And when we have um, important features on the landscape like streams, we do want to minimize our impact as much as possible. And here's a different example of a bridge being removed. Instead of picking up and pulling it off, they pulled that top deck just straight off. So th those methods are, are really helpful for minimizing environmental impacts, but that's not always the case. Um, so you can see in these two photos, um, that's, this is a small bridge replacement um, in the city of Westfield. And there's a small stream right over here. Um, you can see they laid out a bunch of like tarp and they dropped the, the bridge on top of that and then they're removing all of those pieces from there. And then the, the final product is we still have um, that clean waterway. Sometimes we do get stuff into the water, um, and that's where we have coordination with um, Department of Natural Resources to make sure we're minimizing those impacts. Um, and I'll get into more of that in just a little bit. And here's just another, another example, um, just kind of showing there, there's a variety of, of bridges that we have. So on paper, it might sound simple that we just have to replace a bridge. Um, but when we start looking at the structure of that bridge, the, where it's integrated in the landscape, even the quality of that bridge, it gets a little bit more complex when we're trying to minimize our environmental impacts. And there's things that we can do um, out in, on the construction site, especially when we're by streams. Um, we can have barriers in the water to contain a lot of that sedimentation. So we do our best to minimize as much as possible. But before we can construct it, there's a lot that goes into the design, making sure we're meeting those environmental policies, making sure we're doing the best that we can for, for the natural resources as well as um, the people using the transportation system. And we need to make sure all of our projects um, that use federal funds are compliant with, with all of these um, rules and regulations. So our every single project, um, no matter where it is on the landscape, we, we evaluate it for um, all of these things. And I'll just very quickly list what we do. Um, but every project, we send a notification to the, the tribes to see if they have comment, concerns, input they'd like to provide. We also evaluate it for um, architecture, history, um, this is section 106, um, any archaeological sites, um, try to determine if there's burial grounds um, within our project. We coordinate with the Department of Natural Resources, and that's where we, um, we have an agreement specifically with DNR, um, and we work very closely with them to make sure that what we're doing um, is the best for natural resources as to meet their mission as well as our mission for that safe transportation system. So we're working with DNR to make sure that the, the waterways, are the impacts are minimized or if there's any concerns, what those might be. Um, we have to evaluate if there's any public resources, parks, um, any 
public funds that were used, uh, floodplains, um, the list kind of goes on and on. But that doesn't mean every bridge and every spot on the landscape has this intensive coordination effort. And that's where we, we don't want the policy to be intrusive and cumbersome and not be able to allow us to replace the bridges. The policy is there for us to, to be aware of what's on the landscape and do the best that we can. So I have a couple of, of bridge replacements that I thought I would kind of walk through how where it is on the landscape has kind of um, altered which policy we're paying attention to. Um, so this is a, a bridge replacement on the Little Wolf River. So we're going to fly to Wapaka County. So we have this, this bridge that's located right along this river. Um, kind of near um, a rural area surrounded by agriculture. Uh, we don't have any, it's all private property, so we don't have to be concerned about any public parks um, or recreational use. Uh, we do have to be mindful of recreational use of the river. Um, but when we go out and inspect our bridges and evaluate the, the surrounding resources, we'll look for wetlands. We'll identify the type of stream. So this is actually an outstanding waterway, um, and it's a, it's a class one trout stream, I believe. Um, we also inspect that bridge to see if there's uh, birds that are nesting on it. So we need to be mindful of the Migratory Bird Act. Um, and with the listing of northern long-eared bat, there's evidence of bats that use bridges. So now we inspect our bridges for any evidence of bats so that through the construction, we're not impacting them. For this project, we didn't have any migratory birds. Um, we didn't have any bats. But within this outstanding waterway, we do have um, snuffbox mussel. So that is a federally um, endangered mussel. And we, we want to minimize the impacts that we're having to that mussel. So we have a coordination process in design that we have to do. Um, we're working with the designers as well as Federal Highways um, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to create a biological assessment. We're evaluating what the level of take of that species is, um, as well as providing some compensatory mitigation. So we're, we're paying um, on the back end to, to add some more mussels back into the stream. But we're not, we're not going to go out there and just replace this and like kill all the mussels there. We do, before construction, um, they come out, when I say they, that's experts or DNR, um, and they'll remove all of the mussels that they can find within the project area. So we want to minimize that impact as much as possible. And they'll move them farther away from the bridge so that hopefully in 100 years when this is replaced, um, there's fewer mussels. But mussels do move. So the next time that work does occur here, um, the same coordination has to occur. Um, another bridge I'm going to fly you to is located right along the border of Portage and Marathon County. It's on the, the Little O Plain River. We're right in um, the Mead Wildlife Area. Um, so this bridge, a very similar style bridge, completely different stream. So we're still evaluating all of those same aspects. This site has more wetlands. Um, we, ha we still have streams that we, uh, we still have a stream that we want to minimize those impacts, but this stream is considered impaired. Um, there's not as many um, state or federal listed species that lives in this waterway, so we have fewer restrictions um, for species that we have to coordinate and um, work on minimizing that impact to. We also don't have bats on this bridge either, but we do have a lot of nesting swallows. Um, so we can't replace the bridge when 
birds are nesting on it. So that's where then the, the Migratory Bird Act kind of gets applied. So before we can do anything to this bridge, we want to make sure there's no nesting birds. So one of the, the avoidance measures is before construction, before the birds get here, they'll go out and, and net it so that they can't get into, um, into on, on the underside of the bridge to nest in there. And then they can, they can demolish the bridge and replace it and none of the birds were impacted. The other different um, difference with this bridge on the landscape is that Mead wildlife area. So this is a public resource, um, and this property is classified as a, a Section 4F resource. Um, and what that means is um, it's, a, it's a public land that's protected. Um, the federal government doesn't want us coming in and just like taking um, property from these resources. Um, so we want to be very mindful f for our project within, within this landscape. And the, the impacts are a little bit different for a 4F resource, um, for, for a public property. It's more of a, a real estate impact and not a ground disturbance or like animal take disturbance. So we don't want to remove any of that land from that public status that, um, as part of that property. So when we have properties like this on the landscape, we minimize our impact by um, avoiding need for real estate, or we'll just have um, temporary access where we might just need to like access it so that we can grade or, or construct but all of that property at the end of the day will stay in the ownership for the public and then another thing to consider that i want to mention um, especially with the endangered species act is we do have more and more species that are being listed so on the ground for all of our projects we're evaluating that with each listing so for both of these projects, you probably saw that there were trees surrounding them. Due to the northern long-eared bat listing, we do have to evaluate the structure, but we also have to minimize our impacts with the tree cutting that we have to do for the construction. So all of our transportation projects, um, we've moved to tree clearing to occur um, between November and March to minimize any impacts to bats that could be there. And the other thing to consider when it comes to like on the ground is financials as well. Um, Cause technically we could cut trees in the summer um, as long as there's no bats. But financially to prove there's no bats, we'd have to pay someone over and over to go out and make sure there's no bats there. So for a consistent um, method to avoid any impacts, we, we do it in the winter. And then to give another example, we're moving into plover. If you guys were in the area um, last year, a couple years ago, um, there was construction on these two bridges right over by Menards. Um, it wasn't a bridge replacement. Um, the decks were being replaced. Um, but this bridge is located in a completely different landscape. You can see it's more urban. And we have different, different aspects that pop up um, when we're evaluating urban areas. We'll have environmental justice. So we'll want to make sure our projects aren't impacting any um, low-income minority communities. Um, this project, it was more of a like a maintenance rehabilitation, so we didn't we didn't disproportionately impact anybody, but that's something we need to evaluate. But you can see from the surrounding landscape, it's very mowed. Um, there there aren't any endangered species living kind of on this this mowed hillside. So the the environmental coordination, the environmental policies, we didn't have anything that was that was of concern. There's no no birds, no bats. Um, we didn't have any tree cutting. So this project was a little bit more. Um, there was less intensive coordination with different agencies on our impacts. 
and each bridge can have something dramatically different. So back to that bridge that was closed because it's missing, um, we had a different aspect that popped up at this site and that is hazardous materials. So the, the creosote that's in the timber has to be disposed of properly and there's some more, there's some stricter regulations with DNR right now to make sure that the soil that could be impacted by that creosote is also properly disposed of. And then the other interesting thing that occurred at this site, I'm not sure why, but being a closed road, people would just like dump their trash off the edge of the road. Um, so there were like refrigerators, TVs, like deer carcasses and turkey carcasses. Very <laughs> unique situation um, and something we have to consider, especially when we go into construction and we're moving the soil around, we want to make sure that there isn't anything toxic. So a lot of our, all of our projects are evaluated on some level for hazardous materials. And then with uh, the hazardous materials, we also have to check um, all of our bridges for asbestos. And then if we have asbestos, there, there's a whole process for proper disposal on that too. So the one thing to keep in mind with our bridges from, from an environmental aspect is they're, they're an important connection on the landscape um, you can see from these photos, there's a lot of wildlife that, that's using, that go under the bridges instead of going over. I've helped a fair number of turtles cross the road. Um, I'll go out to some of these local bridges and we'll see like in the, the mud under the bridge of just a bunch of tracks. Um, and that's where working with our other agencies, whether uh, some of it's just doing the right thing, um, applying NEPA to its fullest of just improving the landscape. We're able, in some cases, to make it just a little bit better. And we work very closely with, with DNR to make sure um, we, we are improving things the best that we can. So these are two examples of like a small um, animal pathway that was put under the bridges. So we'll fill in the, the riprap with smaller stone um, a cre or create a path so it's easier for the animals to, to get across and go under the bridge instead of going over. Um, so something that Senator Jackson, he's kind of the creator um, of NEPA, um, something I found that he said I think um, it's really the, the intent of the policy and the, the basic principle of the policy is that we must strive in all that we do to achieve a standard of excellence in man's relationship to his physical surroundings. I thought this was, this really summarized it because when we're, we're going into our, our design projects and our construction projects, we're not trying to look at the environment as something that's getting in the way. It's how do we work with it? How do we, how do we make this project happen while also minimizing those impacts um, for us to continue enjoying those natural resources and for the species use, using these areas to keep using that as well. So with that, thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. When uh, the Wisconsin Department of Transportation is uh, proposing a project, do you start with an environmental impact statement or an environmental assessment? Um, the question is, do we start with an, what environmental document type we use? So we actually do a lot of categorical exclusions. Um, so a lot of our projects are considered no significant impacts. So significant has a very specific meaning in the environmental world. Um, so we're, we're doing a lot of categorical exclusion documenting very minimal impacts. Would be 
So I'm going to reiterate your first question um, first, and it's if um, kind of public tourism has has impact on like kind of like our design and what we construct. Yeah. Yes. Tourism is factored into any of this. Um, so there is an aspect of like community um, as well as aesthetics. So the, if there's an area that um, has a very like cultural significance um, or is heavily used, there, there can be efforts put in to make it look aesthetically pleasing. Mm -hmm. um, and then your second question. I was just curious about like, I don't know, people can just be annoying and have so, <laughs> <laughs> experience with that in your job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have to reiterate the question. <laughs> um, what's my experience with public involvement? Um, so public involvement is an aspect um, under NEPA. I don't deal with that directly. There are a few uh, DOT people um, in the crowd that have handled the public. Um, but we can, get, we can get a whole mix um, of no one showing up, um, to a lot of really good support, we really need this bridge replaced. Um, to some that just might be concerned that we're doing a project. So we can have a whole, whole array of comments that we get. People don't have a place to put their trash anymore. <laughs> and that's going to make them angry, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I have a question about. Um, climate change um, that relates to, uh, I guess, this relates to information that has to do with culverts, which I guess are related to the bridges. Mm -hmm. um, so in a climate change class that we do where we go up to Ashland and we talk about NEPA, and the, oh, not, sorry, not NEPA, um, FEMA, wrong acronym. Right, so when culverts flow out and the counties are trying to replace the holders using FEMA money. Mm -hmm. FEMA will only pay for replacing what is there. And so I'm trying to use a parallel of repairing a bridge or replacing a bridge. Um, how often do you think about climate change when you're doing a repair or replacing a bridge? What is that factor? Yeah, so the, the question is, um, evaluating climate change with um, with our bridge replacements and we don't look directly at climate change but we do look at hydrology and hydraulics and flood resilience um, so if we do notice a bridge is constricting the stream we'll want to make that bigger um, we do have a bigger um, more emphasis put on um, we call it aquatic aquatic connectivity making sure that the water can flow through organisms can can get past and we're not pinching that that culvert or that bridge. So you you do when you when you replace a bridge you would make it bigger or if needed. If yeah. Okay, so it's not uh, it's not the direct replacement of what existed because that is what existed in the past. A lot of the applications we get are, we're just replacing it, but that's then through kind of evaluating the landscape, we'll start to say, hey, this is constricting the stream. We need to make it bigger. Um, I actually have a project right now. Um, it's two culverts, but kind of like a bridge. They want to replace the bridge, um, but we're moving the stream is like going at a weird angle. Um, so there's a proposal for realigning the stream so that the bridge isn't skewed so much and it matches that stream better. Cool. And I also just wanted to say I love the idea of thinking about how wildlife might use that space under the bridge. Like, so not just thinking about a bridge as a bridge, but people also thinking about it. I was wondering, how does the DOT determine whether impact is significant? Do you guys use a comparison, or do you look at the absolute impact? So significant under NEPA, that's when we have like the, the EISs, the EAs. Um, the scope of our project, they're um, smaller. Like our, 
what we might, as just like general public, see significant of like wetland fill under like the policy isn't significant. We're not harming the environment or people and health. Um, kind of similar to Kate's <laughs> question, um, do you ever, like, from what I understand from your presentation, is most of the bridge replacement and repairs you're doing are things that are like structurally unsound, um, but let's say a bridge was built 10, 15 years ago, there's nothing structurally wrong with it, but it's uh, an environmental hazard, like, uh, I don't know, with floodwaters are, are cooling up over the edges, or um, is that grounds to replace or repair the bridge, or is that more of like, okay, we need to manage the environment to suit this bridge, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. More recent structure replacements would have evaluated the landscape um, so that we aren't getting that pinch point. Um, but if the, the structure is a good structure, it is harder for us to replace it just due to the requirements from the funding. So there, each bridge um, is reviewed every two years. Um, and it, it gets scored. So for it to be, um, to get federal funds for rehabilitation, it has to meet a specific scoring. For it to get federal funds for replacement, it has to meet a specific scoring. Kind of, um, okay, he was talking about how you know you design underpasses you know, for animals. I don't know if it's in the purview of WSDOT to deal with um, like increases in roadkill. Like there's parts of roads where you get, you get a lot of roadkill. We're talking about wildlife overpasses and underpasses mm -hmm. and bar classes. And Wisconsin doesn't have a lot of them. We've got a few like bird turtles and stuff like that. Is that something that Wisdom gets involved in in terms of you know, safe, providing safe crossing for wildlife? It's something we evaluate, and that one is harder to implement. So you mentioned the, repeat the question. Repeat the question. Um, Designing wildlife passages to limit roadkill. Um, is that something that Wisdom is working on? Um, so with our, our projects, like um, we'll put up have you seen like the turtle fencing? Um, so that's something that we'll put up to try and direct um, creatures through the culvert. But if we don't have a place for that fence to kind of tie into, like that gets a little tricky of like where, where do we end that? Where do we, I mean, with the deer crossing for miles on miles, how do we kind of direct them to one spot? So I know I have a project that um, is in Wood County um, all cranberry area, complete wetland, tons of turtles. But just looking at the landscape, it's like what what can we do to to make a more efficient crossing when the whole thing is a crossing? So if your your class wants a special project. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Rob? So thinking about bridges that connect two different states, so a bridge that goes from Wisconsin to Minnesota, if that needs to be maintained or constructed or anything, how does coordination happen? It's a good question. Um, we have to follow all of the, the policies in both states. So there'll be a, um, like one of us will be the lead. So I have a project right now that's actually on the border with the UP. So we're the lead um, in Wisconsin, and we have to coordinate with um, Michigan's Department of Transportation to make sure we're meeting all of their processes. I didn't anticipate working for Department of Transportation when I sat where you guys sat. Um, I didn't know DOT had environmental people. 
Um, but I, I went to grad school. I took a different, um, a few different like um, contract positions, um, and ended up back in Central Wisconsin looking for a variety of natural resource jobs. Um, and I applied for this one. It had a variety of um, different aspects that we look at that kind of explained. Um, and I've really enjoyed my role here to being able to, to advocate for the environmental piece because um, the engineers didn't go to school for, for that side and being able to educate people a little bit more on why we need to follow these things and why it's important. Yes. I will eventually get to a question. <laughs> I have to repeat it. <laughs> Remember the beginning by the time the end comes in. Yeah, I'll, I'll let you know when the questions come back. <laughs> I want to say for, uh, for a lot of our students, Bree started as a student about the same time that uh, Dr. McKitch and I started as faculty here. So she was one of our you know, first uh, kind of rock star student experiences, and I think part of what made you you're such a fun and interesting student to work with was uh, you were you know, majoring in soils, I believe, at the time. Waters. Waters, waters. And, uh, but you were a co-leader on the Woodpecker Project for the Wildlife Society, uh, which was super cool, and ended up publishing in a peer-reviewed journal some of the work you did as an undergrad. Um, and now you've, I mean, you've kind of been in various parts of the country, and uh, as you said, you were in a position that you didn't anticipate being in. So the question is, um, given your, you know, all this variety that you've had in your life and work experience, uh, what advice do you have for our students about being nimble and flexible as they look forward to their so the question is, what advice do I have for being flexible um, when you guys are pursuing your careers? Um, and the biggest thing is being open to different opportunities. Um, there, there are so many different jobs in different states, in different um, cities, towns, um, that hit on a variety of different things. When I went to school, I thought, yeah, water quality biologist, I know exactly what that is. Um, I never ended up getting that career. Um, some of it's what jobs are open. Um, but what, we, what I learned in school um, was completely different than what I did in a career, in a job. Um, and some of it's learning in the job. So don't feel like you're unqualified when you're applying. Um, take that risk, do those interviews. Um, you can always turn something down. Um, but just kind of have fun when you're looking at the different jobs that are out there. And be curious about what those jobs could be.